Kathy, let me know when we hit four. Okay, we'll give it another minute then. these people get seated. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Raymond, and I'm going to explain to you why we should dynamite all the centralized software forges, the things like GitHub and GitLab and, and Bitbucket, why we should dynamite all these and replace them with something better. I'm also going to tell you how we can do it, and because I don't believe in running my mouth without writing code, uh, I'm going to talk about a prototype I've written that I think points the way forward. Why centralized forges are a problem? Well, <clears throat> what's the first rule of internet software engineering? Single points of failure are bad. Single points of failure are bad. The, the, the internet was designed to eliminate those, to avoid centralization, to avoid any one location, any one installation that could be taken out and bring the network down. And as regards transport layers, we've learned that lesson pretty well. We have TCP IP, we know how to make it work. The, uh, the transport layer of the internet is not really very vulnerable to single point failure. Forget, you get further up the stack, things change. <sighs> proprietary single insta installation social media is the most obvious example. But I'm not here to talk about those today, except in the sense that forge sites are a specialized kind of social medium. Because what they really are is message buses. Um, they're message buses with uh, repositories hanging off them. But I'll get, the, get back into that in a moment after I talk about the dimensions of the threat. Single point failure in software forges is not just a theoretical problem. We've had three major incidents which illustrate the peril. The first one was when Gatorius collapsed. Anybody here use Gatorius back when it was active? I did. Um, Gatorius collapsed and although there were reasonably good provisions made for uh, projects to migrate off it, not all of them did, which is why there is a site called Gatorius Valhalla. <laughs> it is a website which exists to provide a static snapshot of as many Gatorius projects as possible taken at the time that the site was last active. So yeah, we have real world evidence that we can in fact lose projects, we can lose valuable knowledge when one of these sites goes goes down. <coughs> the second incident that was disturbing was the corruption of SourceForge. Uh, some of you may remember that in, I think it was 2016, SourceForge in a desperate move to uh, squeeze more money out of its role, started um, picking up semi-abandoned projects and stuffing adware in their installers. So you download uh, one of their corrupted installers, you get spammed forever. Um, that was bad. Um, but the most disturbing incident was a very recent one, uh, which was um, GitHub damaging quite a number of projects by yanking pull requests and comments made by developers based in Russia. Now, that's a hell of a slippery, slippery slope. You can be a... a you can be, you, you can want the Ukrainians to win the war against Russia and still think that censoring Russian developers for political reasons is a really bad idea, which puts us on a slippery slope towards projects being damaged because somebody has a wild hair about transient this week political issue. We're, and, and because we want to head that off, 
it would be a really good idea to eliminate these, these uh, single site forges as positions of power that can be abused. So that describes the dimensions of the problem. And it's, it's really odd that we're stuck here because we have Git, it's more or less eaten the world, and it has the delightful property that whenever you clone a Git repository, you get the entire history of the code, which makes the code for a Git, uh, a, a Git hosted project extremely difficult to delete, censor, or destroy because there are copies of it everywhere. And it has this nice anti-censorship property, which is that if you try and delete a commit in the history, you invalidate the Merkle chain going forward, so suddenly the repository can't sync with, with other derivatives of the code base. Um, of, oh, or other derivatives of the, of the ancestral repository, I should say. But we ended up stuck in this place because although Git is well adapted for decentralized use, the forges aren't. And I think we ended up there by an act, a, a forage is by definition a site where you've got one website and it's got a bunch of projects on it and the projects are repositories, but the projects are also metadata, messages, like, um, like issues, merge requests, and possibly other things that are uh, less frequently used. Um, and those are represented at one of that one location, and if that one location uh, goes down or is damaged, either by accident or censorship or whatever, you're kind of screwed. It shouldn't be this way. What, why have the, 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 one wonders, looking at this, why we threw away the decentralization properties of Git and got stuck with these, these uh, single site servers. And, what's that? Yeah, well, I think it's because of the accident that the first forge was built before Git rather than after it. Um, but, so, having identified the problem, what can we do next? And the gentleman who just spoke up here, Mark Atwood, is an old friend of mine, and he's been urging me to work on this problem since 2009. And, what was that? Oh, 2006. <laughs> so he's been urging me to work on this problem for empty bump years. And I took a good hard look at it. There are some interesting precedents. There are distributed bug trackers, of which one of the best known is uh, SD. And I could, took a good hard look at it, and I concluded uh, that I thought it was a really bad idea to, to, to try to do this. The reason is that code changes and bug reports have different immediacy requirements. Git is designed to support a workflow where you, there's a project uh, merrily evolving along, and somebody gets an idea for a feature, and they make a feature branch, and they go off into a cave for a month and hack on the feature, feature branch, um, and uh, eventually they come back and they merge the feature branch into the main line, and that's usually relatively easy, which is to say that code changes don't have high immediacy. You don't need everybody to see your code changes until your branch is, is fully baked and you're ready to merge again. Bug reports, on the other hand, have very high immediacy. You want the, the entire developer group to see them as quickly as possible. That's very important. And <clears throat> the problem is that um, Git push-pull is designed so that it does a good job on the low immediacy, immediacy job of supporting decentralized uh, code development. But I, I thought, when I thought about how it would propagate bugs, push-pull just isn't fast enough in particular, because you don't know when people are going to push and pull. It's a random, irregular, and slow process. So that caused me to conclude that this wasn't a good idea. Until about three months ago, when Mark and I were chatting about it, and I had an insight. The insight was this. The channel over which you propagate your bug reports to other repositories and the channel over which you propagate them to human eyeballs don't have to be the same channel. So, you write a system where you make a bug report uh, and it starts its way of, pro it starts propagating to other repositories via push-pull, but at the point that you entered it into your repository, it also gets mailed to a subscriber list. So, human beings may see the bug 
report well before a copy prop propagates to their repository. The goal in a system like this is that all the repositories are eventually consistent. And I, I'll define that a little better when I talk about, uh, well, let me name my prototype now. It's called Shimmer. I've been working on it for three months. And the architecture of Shimmer looks like this. It adds just one thing, uh, fundamentally, to uh, Git repositories. Every Shimmer-enabled Git repository has inside it a message queue. A message queue is not a complicated thing. It's just a sequence of RFC 822 messages. They look like email. Email is a very flexible and general format for this kind of thing. And there are only two operations on a message queue. You can append a new message to your local queue, or you can do a sync operation with another repository. And when you do that, your traffic that it doesn't have goes to that, the, the upstream repository. And any traffic that it doesn't have, the, the, it has that you don't have, gets pulled down to yours. So, uh, so providing that people are actually doing syncs, Everybody reaches a state of eventual consistency where they're seeing the same messages, they're seeing the same set of messages, but not necessarily in the same arrival order. It's like relativity. There's no master clock. There's no privileged reference frame. Um, so once I got this idea of, of just embedding a message queue and a prompt notification through some kind of push channel, which right now is email, but it could be IRC, or it could be Slack, or it could be Matrix, or it could be Discord. It doesn't matter, architecturally speaking. The point is, if there, is some, there, if there are push channels you can use, you use them. Once I got the basic idea of, uh, of synchronizing message queues and fast push notifications, everything else is details. This is a devastatingly simple idea. Once you have those two core concepts, the rest of it, just, the, the rest of it is mostly writing user interface. So, uh, so where did this come from? Well, Mark um, was pushing me to work on it, and I looked at uh, SD. But I want to uh, name a couple of other systems that I learned um, from, and also explain why Shimmer is doing more than these systems. People who have done something like this before were generally only thinking about distributed bug tracking. They weren't thinking about at least two other things which I think were important. One is representing merge requests, pending merge requests. And uh, the other is swallowing project mailing lists. My goal in designing this became to get to the point where everything that all the metadata that normally travels with a project on a site like GitLab, GitLab's my user interface model because that's what I normally use, everything that travels with a project on GitLab ought to be embedded in the repository and whenever that repository is replicated, all that metadata travels along with the code history. Now you have unkillable, uncensorable projects. So I think this is worth doing. So um, let me describe what I've done so far uh, and where I think it's going next. Uh, oh, I was talking about predecessor systems. The other important precedent uh, is, actually there are two. Uh, there was a bug tracker called Roundup. Uh, the Python guys used it as uh, their bug tracker for 17 years before they eventually switched to using GitHub. And I learned something important from, from um, Roundup. It was brilliantly designed. It was designed by um, Ka Ping Yi, who I knew slightly back around the turn of the millennium. Back then, he was a, he was a precociously, brilliantly scary kid. I suspect he's no longer a kid or precocious, but I suspect the scary bright has not gone away. Um, what I learned from studying Roundup is that everything is a message queue. Everything is annotated messages with some special semantics on the headers. So I sort of had that in my back pocket when I started thinking about Shimmer. There was also Fossil, and the guy who wrote Fossil is here, Richard Hipp. He also, he's also the author of SQLite, SQLite 3. Is it SQLite or SQLite 3? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Richard is, a, is a, a very, very capable designer and very intelligent and has a lot of taste. And it shows in Fossil 
from which I cribbed some ideas. One of the ideas I cribbed from Fossil is Shimmer, for all the things it does, and I'm going to go into those, is just one program. It's just one binary. You run it in different modes to get different behaviors that you want. That's, a, that's very Fossil. Um, there are some other things maybe I'll talk about a bit later in context. So having looked at these systems and having had this basic idea of you mate push notification to uh, fast push notification to normal propagation, and then you have a message queue, I sat down and started writing code because I, and I realized you want at least three things. First, you want a command line tool that let, lets you manipulate these message queue, uh, queues from scripts. That was the easiest part to write. Then, you want a TUI, a terminal mode uh, interface, terminal user interface, because there are circumstances where Yes, it would be nice to be able to use a web page, but sometimes you're doing things like um, going over SSH to a, a, a system that doesn't have a web server, uh, that doesn't have uh, HTTPS access, and you want to be able to manipulate the, uh, the Shimmer Meta data that, that way. And also, I figured if I wrote a terminal user interface, it would help me be sure that I had the basic operations and the, work fa the workflow correct before I took on the additional complication of writing a, a, a web UI. So I wrote that, that part's done. Um, and a, a point I want to make about that is, um, I believe when it comes to user interface design, I believe in, really, in being really boring and expected. I do not believe in surprising my users. I don't want to be clever. I don't want to be original. I want to produce a UI that as much as possible matches the expectations they already have about similar tools, which is why if you have, if you, when you fire up uh, the, the Shimmer TUI, it's going to look a lot like MUT, and it's going to look a lot like Pine. It's going to look like a traditional non-web mail reader. Hey, why not? After all, the message queue is a bunch of RFC 822 messages, and there again, uh, I could have been um, superficially clever and come up with some fancy new message format, I don't know, XML or something like that. But you know, why do that? RFC 822 is, is sufficient for the job. You just need to have text with a bunch of head control headers. And there's a very rich ecology of tools and libraries for that format. So yeah, why design something new? Um, so um, the TOI looks like a traditional mail, mail reader. And then the third interface, which I'm working on now, is, uh, is web service. And the way this works is there's a bunch of commands for Shimmer, and most of them are, are, are uh, command line commands. And then there's Shimmer Browse, which brings up the TUI, and you're assumed to be inside a repository directory at that point. That's if you, um, and then there's Shimmer Serve. And if you say Shimmer Serve, it issues you a message saying, hi, I'm starting up a web server. Connect your browser to this point. And at that point, you connect your browser to, uh, I think my default is port 3033, and you get a web page. And the web page lets you navigate through the various layers of the Shimmer interface. The, there's a landing page where you get a, it, your, the site you're going to is hosting some collection of Shimmer-enabled repositories. And you get a page that says, here's your index of repositories. And for each one, you have a name and a description just like a conventional forge. Uh, the way I handle that, by the way, is since it's a rule that everything has to be, all the state has to be inside the repository, there's a config file you can set that says, here's my name among humans, and here's my description. This is what I advertise to Shimmer. And uh, it's that's done in YAML, uh, in, in case any of you care. It's a good format for that kind of thing. Um, right, so web interface. You, you get When you get there first, you see a, a, a list of repositories. Right now, uh, e each item in the list has a button underneath it that will go either will, will go to the issue queue or to the merge requests or to the embedded mailing lists, which for historical reasons involving find or not, I call echoes. Is that term familiar to anybody here? I guess not. I guess I'm just old. Uh, so I never used FIDONET, by the way, but I, th I thought that was actually a good term for the way they did mailing lists, and I decided to co-opt it. So uh, if you, you choose those buttons, you can go to an issue list or a merge request list or a, uh, 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 
or a echoes list, and that gives you a list of actual message threads. Each message thread it has a title, and it has a sequence of RFC 822 messages that you can browse, just like the issue, lab on, issue lists on GitHub or GitLab. In fact, it's going to present a very similar interface. The way that's done internally is there aren't actually separate queues. All of these things are just tags sitting in the, ma in, in the one big message queue, which is very, very flexible. You need a new to a topic, um, or would you like a message to be part of uh, both the development list and the issue list at the same time, no problem. You just attach the appropriate tags. Uh, also, I didn't want to constrain the kinds of things we could do with Shimmer by uh, wiring in lots of different message types. Um, having one thing that's basically just an RFC A22 message is that if we figure out something else that needs to be communicated that can be turned into a uh, uh, an attribute value list and a bunch of text, we can just do that. It's just a tag. It's just a tag and maybe so, some special processing somewhere in the interface. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, part of the reason I wanted to come here and give this talk is I'm a pretty good network programmer. I'm a pretty good systems architect. I'm good enough to get from zero to what I'm describing in, in three months. Uh, oh, and by the way, let me recommend Go for projects like this. Go is a spectacularly good language for writing this kind of web service. Uh, it's so good that everything I've described to you, I managed to implement in um, 2.5 physical lines of code and about 800 logical lines of code. Yeah, that good. Of course, I've leaned heavily on the, li the libraries, but then you should do that. Uh, okay, oh no, I didn't describe the, the third level of the interface. If you select a thread, you get a whole list of messages. Wow! How novel, how exotic. But that's what you actually need. I, one of my goals is to support the kind of de development experience that people are used to having on forges without the limitations of forges. Um, and the uh, one of the reasons I'm here is, as I said, I'm a pretty good network programmer. I'm a pretty good systems architect. I'm not a top shelf web designer. <laughs> I mean, I learned how to do it a long time ago, but the result is my technique is archaic. If you actually look at the Shimmer interface the way it is now, it's kind of 1990s. Now, in a way, that's actually good. One of the design decisions I've made is I would like to be able to support people who don't want to enable JavaScript because there are security and performance issues with that. So one of the design decisions I've made is there's always going to be a mode of the web interface where you can turn off JavaScript and use it anyway. And I'm concentrating on designing the no JavaScript interface. That should enable me to get the basic operations and the workflow for the web right, but I would very much like to recruit somebody who knows how to design web front ends better than I do uh, and and uh, help out doing the JavaScript one. So if you're interested in that, uh, talk to me afterwards. I think the plan is for, uh, I asked Jeremy, uh, I don't know where the location is, but we're supposed to have a birds of a feather group after this talk uh, so that people who can, who can uh, want to follow this up can talk with me about it. You can just be hanging out here if you want. Okay, very good. Uh, if yeah, anybody doesn't leave, I'm going to assume, uh, assume you're interested and willing to be sucked into the vortex. <laughs> uh, so that's more or less comes to the end of the architectural description. Um, and I was able to describe it in a few minutes because I followed the first rule of good systems architecture, which is keep it simple, stupid. The world is full of overweight, overcomplicated protocols, overweight, overcomplicated systems, and they all tend to have failure points because they have too many joints. I am steadfastly trying to avoid this with this system. Uh, ideally, I want to keep uh, Shimmer one program uh, and small enough so that a reasonably competent hacker can get his head around it in an afternoon. I think this is actually possible. Ah, but I should talk about one other kind of thing we're going to have to write. And that is scraper programs. We want Shimmer to be able to, uh, to take a URL that points to a project instance on a forge 
and given only that information, exercise the Forge's <laughs> JSON interface so that it pulls down all the metadata that we want to capture and embeds it in the repository as a shimmer queue. Uh, that's something we're going to have to write. Um, I, I'll probably write that myself. That kind of thing is right up my alley. But I need a web designer. Um, and so with that, questions, comments? Right, okay. It's just like Git in that the shape of the swarm is up to you. A lot of projects may actually have a central repository at a public location and a starlight communication pattern. That's okay. You can do that if your central site goes away. Your people are just going to have to communicate to set up a new rendezvous. Okay. Or you could have a more blob-like or tree-like structure like the Linux kernel where there are, there's, there's one mas master repository, all right, but there are also lieutenants who are maintaining interior nodes that are covering particular topic areas like, like uh, kernel drivers, different architectures, and so forth. The shape of the swarm is up to you. The point is the synchronization, synchronization primitive I've defined is powerful enough to support any connected set of repositories. And the, ex the expectation is that any one of these repositories at any time can go shimmer serve and stand up a web view into the swarm. Was that a useful answer? Okay, I haven't explained myself well enough. The only reason Shimmer knows about multiple projects at all is because there are going to be times when you want to have several different projects uh, um, visible on the same host. But those projects don't know anything about each other at all. all their metadata is all embedded in the repository and well separated both from other repositories and from any state information that Shimmer itself is holding. So there's no mirroring. There's, I'm not sure I'm a, I understand your question well enough to answer it. Well, I was just trying to envision if this, like, if this was like a GitHub or source, source for the place you need where everything is like centralized, is it something like... No, we want to destroy centralization. That's the point. So, um, I don't, have you ever heard of like the crypto technologies like Chia, for example, where you can like um, join the Chia farm and participate in the Chia farm and like you're, you're serving the whole thing along with everyone? Yeah. You, you, um, you, you stand up a, um, a shimmer instance and you either did it yourself or if you put it up on the internet with the right sort of access control and other things that are coming, every shimmer node has all the data, all of the source data for the set of repositories that you're interested in that you set up in your queue. Um, but it may, have a d it may have an incomplete view because it's possible that at any given Shimmer location, not all the message traffic has landed yet. Eventually, they're all consistent and synchronized, but at any given point in time, some of them may only be partial images of the queue. Yeah.
That's one of the design premises. There is, when you're manipulating your Shimmer project, there is nothing outside the repository. It's all embedded there. Yeah. We have. <laughs> we have. Um, that's actually solving a different set of issues. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we have looked at it. There is a possible future in which Shimmer is manipulating Git repositories that are running over IPFS. That would be the, the correct order of the layers. More questions? Back there. You mentioned that the repository holds all of the data. Yeah. What if you're like working on a feature branch and then you need to get away from the interface? Well, your that then that feature branch is only in your repository and until you decide to push it to the swarm, push it to your upstream. Just the same way convention conventional Git works. The only thing that's different really is the message queue and the message queue synchronization. Yeah. Oh no, the, the the email notification is absolutely part of the plan. Um in fact, I want to emphasize store and forward notification rather than direct mm -hmm. SMTP because one of the subsidiary design goals is you're on a plane you can't get internet you want to be able to do shimmer things which means that you want to be able to make lo local modifications knowing that you can send the notifications and even though you're off the internet as soon as you land and reconnect your store and forward mailer daemon is going to ship them out Well, that's what's normally going to happen. In fact, it's going to work very similar to the way GitLab does now, which is you get a notification in your mailbox that says some, that a message has been added to a, a issue report thread, and then you go, oh, I need to go look at the website and see what's going on. It's going to work exactly the same way. Only, as far as I know, none of the centralized forges have things like Slack and matrix integration, which we don't have yet either, but it's on the roadmap at least. Yes? Um, one very useful feature in existing bug trackers is the, is the ability to link to other projects, whether other bugs or just other stuff. Can you show another way to do that? Currently, there is nothing on the roadmap for that. It's something I'm willing to think about. Uh, the problem with that kind of feature is those kind of, of pointers are necessarily location dependent and that means uh-oh if that location goes away that pointer means nothing anymore and that's something I kind of want to try to avoid though I don't see a way around it it's the generic problem with universal resource links versus universal resource indicators uh, but no that's not on the roadmap currently
this is the first public talk about Shimmer. <laughs> I mean, we are literally talking about something that I I invented um, three months ago and have been coding on frantically since. And in fact, I, uh, it was just, it was just f four days ago that I got the prototype web interface working, which I, it's something I desperately wanted to say, be able to say I have working before I came to Self and gave a talk about it. So it's very alpha yet. I haven't published any papers. Yeah, there is a public repository. And I am aware of the irony. Yes, we are going to be. <laughs> it's, it's going to become self-hosting. My goal is w that once we get a, a web interface that is approximately as nice as GitLab, at that point we self-host. Because I don't want people to go from GitLab, and I'm only singling out GitLab because that's what I use. Git, GitHub's nearly equivalent. I'm, I don't want people to experience going from GitLab to Shimmer as a degradation in the quality of their user experience. That would be bad. Next question. Oh my goddess, have I bored you all to tears already? Oh yeah, back there. Ah, you've hit on a serious sore point. That's one sore point is authentication. The other related one is anti-spam. Um, so far, there is no authentication in the system. Um, the few of us who know about Shimmer are having an internal conversation about whether we should have authentication at all at this point. Um, Mark over here maintains that the entire web authentication thing is going to change radically within the next year so that anything we, we, we do will be obsolete by the time we ship it. So, uh, and that kind of inclines with, um, my, with, agrees with what I'd like to do. I would prefer to have no authentication at all and really good anti-spam filters. And that may be the way we end up going for a while. But anti-spam filters are a problem uh, they're a bigger problem because once a, a message has gone into the, a local queue and starts being propagated, it's immutable. It's part of the history forever, which is kind of annoying if it's a Viagra advertisement. <laughs> so uh, we need to have really good anti-spam tools. We don't know what anti-spam tools for this application look like. So we're going to count on the fact that initially individual um, shimmer enabled repositories will probably have a message submission rate low enough that human moderation is reason reasonable. So the plan is to dump drive-by patches into a moderation queue where a human being looks at them and says, this is okay, it goes into the queue and starts getting propagated, or this is spam, I'll just drop it. So that's our solution so far. It's not a very good solution. I think we'll evolve better ones. Ah, but Git already has that problem. That's right. The only thing you, you have to do to spoof someone else's identity is set a field in is two fields in your, gig con your Git configuration. So there's an argument that we shouldn't necessarily bother trying to have stronger authentication than Git itself does. We're, but we're still thinking about this. Yeah? Right there. It's called search engines. <laughs> um, and actually, one of the things I'm thinking about, and this is this isn't on the official roadmap yet, but I got to write it down at some point. One of the things I think the web interface is going to end up eventually end up doing is whenever it uh, generates a new project page, it's also going to generate a static project page in a location where a search engine can see. And I think that's enough of a solution for the catalog problem. 
Because if you get the word that there is a project out there that uh, 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 implements turbo encabulation, and you do a web search for turbo encabulation, provided those static web pages exist, search engine's probably going to find it. Um, we've also had a suggestion, again from Mark, that we have a um, direct, we use the API of the Internet Archive, which all the search engines look at. So, yeah. Next, I th think there was at least one other person with a question. Correct. Nope. Good question. I, at, at one point, I had a shimmer init <laughs> command, but I discarded it. If you run shimmer on a repository that, that uh, does not have a refs notes, oh, this is a detail I left out. Uh, the message queue is actually implemented using an obscure Git feature called notes. How many people know about this? <laughs> no, not many. Uh, Git notes is something that they wrote in uh, so that you would be able to put annotations on a commit after it was committed, which is you can't do within conventional Git objects because conventional Git objects, once they're in the repository, they're immutable, unless you have a copy of Repo Surgeon. But that, that I digress. Um, the so since things are, since Git objects are meant to be immutable. Um, they wanted a way to attach annotations to commits after the fact. And I have brazenly subverted this mechanism to implement my message queue. All the notes live on a special notes branch called refs notes shimmer. Uh, and if that branch doesn't exist, shimmer just says, I see no messages here, <laughs> nothing to do. And if you try to sync a repository like that, well, it has a defined up, up, upstream, but there isn't any message traffic, so it doesn't do anything. You shimmer enable a repository by the simple act of using shimmer to start your message queue. It's not more complicated than that. Now, if you want to get all web fancy and friendly at all, you probably also want to create a, uh, a config file on your ref notes shimmer branch that has two pieces of information on it, the project's name and the project's description. There, you're done. So, yeah, it's not much of an enablement process. Um, CI will probably happen, but it's far down the road. Um, I want to get the basic synchronization primitives uh, I want to get the synchronization, well, synchronization primitives and the UI working first, and the model pr partly accepted, widely accepted, and people starting to migrate before we put a lot of effort into CI. CI poses some pretty special anti-spam problems because people will try to abuse your CI infrastructure to, for example, mine Bitcoin. Yes. Yeah, that's the CI we're talking about. I, I love automated CI on push. I want to do it eventually. It's not in the first six months, though. Uh, okay, so sort of yes and no. At the moment, Git is the only supported system, but because I'm a systems architect, all of that stuff, all of the, the, the Git access primitives are isolated in one layer, one class actually, and the, all that the rest of the, uh, the, the system knows about are the methods in that class. If I wanted to support Mercurial tomorrow, it prob would probably take about three hours. Um, I don't feel like I really need to support Fossil because it's its own version control system. 
Uh, in fact, that's the, that's the only, that's the one thing that went tragically wrong with Fossil, and it was not Richard's fault. He wrote Fossil in 2006, and at that point, Git had not yet eaten the world, and writing his own version control system looked reasonable. But I told him yesterday, if you had written Fossil as a shell around Git, rather than rolling your own VCS, I'd be doing something else right now. He almost got there. Of all the predecessor systems, he was the closest to getting where Shimmer is. <laughs> it's a floor wax. It's a dessert topping. It's a floor wax. It's a dessert topping. You're both wrong. New Shimmer is both a floor wax and a dessert topping. I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> yes? In general, yes. Uh, since you can GPG sign anything that looks like an RFC 822 message, suddenly you're in a world where, without any further assumptions in the system, you can, you can GPG sign those messages, and people can read those GPG signatures and use them. It's not integrated into the rest of the interface planning yet. Ask me again in six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, this is all tied into the huge hairball that is authentication and anti-spam. And uh, there are things to be done first before we tackle that. Well, have I bored everybody sufficiently? What time is it? Oh, okay, yes, then, then we have to wrap this up. If you're interested in participating in the development of this thing, and especially if you can do web UIs, stick around. Everybody else, thank you for listening.
Josh. It, it, it generates either HTML or, or, or uh, JSON. It's the same code.